Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your presence. How wonderful it is to have your word. We can't imagine what it would be like to be in this world without any guidance as to where things are going, where things are moving to. But we thank you that you've given us the sure word of prophecy so that we can know where we are and where we're going. Father, we ask that as we open your word this afternoon that your spirit will be with us. Give us clear minds and receptive hearts. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to begin in our study today by reading the passage that we are going to take a look at in the next hour that we will be together. Matthew chapter 24 and I want to read all of the verses that we will be dealing with. Matthew 24 and beginning with verse actually 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads let him understand, let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather His elect from the four winds from when one end of heaven to the other. This is the long passage that we're going to take a look at in our study today. There are many things that we need to cover and we're going to try and do it within the time constraints that we have which is one lecture. We could actually dedicate many lectures to each one of these topics that we've been studying. But unfortunately when you're producing programming for television you have to stay within strict parameters of time. Now the first thing that I would like us, like us to notice is the sequence of events that we find here in Matthew chapter 24. And I want to compare the sequence with the book of Revelation. The first thing that I want us to notice is that verse 14 speaks about the preaching of the gospel. Remember that, the preaching of the gospel. Immediately after that verse, in verse 15, we find the setting up of the abomination of desolation, which we have interpreted by our study as a national Sunday law. We notice however that there is going to be a group of people at this time who will be keeping God's holy Sabbath. And so you'll notice we have the preaching of the gospel, 
then we have the abomination of desolation which separates two groups it separates those who leave the city from those who stay within the city it separates those who keep the Sabbath who flee and those who stay in the city and are there when the abomination of desolation is set up. Then I want you to notice that immediately after this you have the great tribulation that we read about. Then at the end of the tribulation you have signs in the heavens and then you have the coming of Jesus to pick up His people. Now it's interesting to notice that this very sequence of events we find in the book of Revelation. And you say, how is that? Allow me to make the parallel. Revelation 14 verse 6 speaks about the preaching of the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Interestingly enough, after the three angels' messages are proclaimed, after the gospel in this new context is presented to the world, we find at the end of chapter 14 two groups. There are those who are sealed with the seal of God, which is God's holy Sabbath. And we find those who are marked with the mark of the beast. This is parallel to what we found in Matthew chapter 24. Interestingly enough, once God's people have been sealed, and once the followers of the beast have been marked, then in Revelation 15 you have the close of probation and beginning in chapter 16 you have the falling of the plagues upon the earth. A terrible time of trouble and crisis on the planet when the plagues are falling upon the earth. Then interestingly enough when you get to chapter 19 you see Jesus Christ seated on a white horse and the angels of heaven are on white horses following Jesus to come to this world to pick up His people. Now a careful study reveals then that the sequence of events of Matthew chapter 24 is the same sequence of events of the book of Revelation. Only different symbols are actually used. Now notice uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21. It says there, then there shall be great tribulation. He said, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now before we study this verse and the succeeding verses, there's something very important that I need to explain. And that is that the abomination of desolation, the tribulation, and the signs in the heavens have two fulfillments or actually they're fulfilled in two stages. You're saying how is this? Well let me explain it. The book of Revelation speaks about a beast and we're told that this beast rules 42 months. But we're told that at the end of the 42 months when this beast persecutes the saints of the Most High the beast receives a deadly wound. And for a while the beast is out of commission. It doesn't function. But after a period we're told that its deadly wound is healed. And the whole world marvels after the beast and once again the beast persecutes. So what I'm saying is that this beast power has two stages of dominion. It has a past stage during the 42 months and it will have a future stage when uh, the deadly wound of this beast is healed. The same could be said of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. It speaks about the little horn. The little horn persecutes the saints of the Most High. The little horn thinks it can change God's law. And we know that the Roman Catholic papacy attempted to change the Sabbath. Now when you get to the book of Revelation, you have a future fulfillment to what the little horn did. Once again, God's people will be persecuted and we find also that the mark of the beast is going to be imposed in the end time upon God's people on pain of death. In other words the change in God's law or the attempted change in God's law in Daniel 7.25 in the past 
during the 1260 years represents the future period when the mark of the beast which is the change in the law which is the counterfeit day of worship will be imposed upon people by force of law. You know we've been studying the seals in prayer meeting and it's interesting to notice that there are also two stages of martyrs in the seven seals of Revelation. You have the first four seals. The first one represents the apostolic church. The second seal represents the persecuted church under the Roman emperors. The third church represents when darkness entered the church in the days of Constantine. The fourth, church, the fourth seal represents the period when death came into the church, the period of the inquisition. And then in the fifth seal, which is equivalent by the way to the fifth church as well, in the fifth seal you have these martyrs crying out. They're crying out until Lord, until when Lord don't you judge and avenge our blood on those who shed our blood upon the earth. And this first group of martyrs that is crying out is told to rest a little while until the rest of the martyrs is complete which will be killed as they were killed. Once again the fourth seal represents the period when God's people were slain during the 1260 years. But when the deadly wound is healed there is going to be another group of martyrs before the close of probation and then the number of the martyrs will be complete. So what I want us to realize is that this period of tribulation has two stages. The first stage is during the 1260 years. The second stage is in the future after the deadly wound is healed. The first stage are those martyrs that were slain during the 1260 years. The second stage is when God's people will be slain if they do not receive the mark of the beast. The first stage is where the beast rules for 42 months. The second stage is where its deadly wound is healed and it will persecute again. So the abomination of desolation has a past application and a future application. The past application is when the little horn thought he could change God's law. The future application is when the same power imposes the day of worship, the false day of worship, which is Sunday upon the world. Not only does the abomination of desolation have a twofold application, but the tribulation as well. During the 42 months, this beast or this little horn persecuted God's people. In the future, it is once again going to persecute God's people. In the past, during the Middle Ages, God's people had to flee. In the end time, God's people are going to have to flee. In both cases, we find signs in the heavens that mark the end of the Great Tribulation. You know there were signs in the heaven we're going to notice when the 1260 years were coming to an end. But the Bible tells us that in connection with the second coming of Jesus there will be great signs in the heavens announcing the coming of Jesus. Signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now allow me to read you a couple of very interesting statements that we find in the spirit of prophecy in the writings of Ellen White where it shows that she understood, she caught this idea of two stages to the great tribulation. The first is in Desire of Ages page 631. This is the past stage. She says for more than a thousand years such persecution as the world had never before known was to come upon Christ's followers. Millions upon millions of his faithful witnesses were to be slain. Had not God's hand been stretched out to preserve his people, all would have perished. But for the elect's sake, he said, those days shall be shortened. So she's talking about the first stage. By the way, we can't refer to this as two separate tribulations. They are two tribulations, they're actually two tribulations in one because the future one is a continuation of the past one with a short interruption in between. Are you understanding what I'm saying? During the time that the deadly wound is in force. Now notice what she says about the future application of this period of tribulation. Review and Herald November 22, 1892. She says we are to realize that the judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. 
and we should most earnestly present before the people the warning that the Lord has commissioned us to give. And then notice the quotation, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now some people say, but Pastor Bohr, uh, it says in Matthew chapter 24 that this is such a terrible tribulation that it has never been seen and it never will be seen again. So how can you say that this tribulation during the 1260 years was the worst and then say that the future tribulation is also going to be the worst? The fact is that the persecution and the tribulation during the Middle Ages was the worst with regards to length. Whereas the tribulation at the end of time is going to be the worst with respect to intensity. So there are two emphases in other words. The tribulation during the Middle Ages was the longest. It lasted over a thousand years in length. But the end time tribulation is going to be more intense such as the world has never seen. Now I want you to notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22 we just mentioned verse 21, let's read verse 22. It says, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be what? No flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. Who are the elect? You know you read the books that have been written on Bible prophecy today that you find in bookstores. They'll tell you that the elect are the Jews that re will remain on planet earth, earth after the church has been raptured to heaven. But unfortunately, or fortunately rather, that explanation does not square with scripture. Do you know for example that this word elect is the same word that is translated in the New Testament, chosen? In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, uh, Peter says, you are a chosen generation. It's interesting to notice also that in Romans chapter 8 it says that the, the elect are those that have been justified, those that have been sanctified. In other words the elect are those who have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now let me ask you, are God's elect going to go through the end time tribulation? Obviously because it says here that unless these days were shortened not one person would remain alive but they're going to be shortened because of whom? The elect. If the elect aren't going to go through this period why would God need to shorten these days? You know who wants us to think that we're not going to go through the tribulation? It's the devil. Because the devil knows that we're going to need a special faith to get through the tribulation. It's going, to be a it's going to be a faith that needs to be strong in the face of opposition, in the face of hunger, in the face of loss of liberty, in the face of even the risk of losing our lives. The devil knows that. And so the devil tells Christians, hey you're not going to be on planet earth during the tribulation, you're going to be enjoying the glories of heaven and the Jews on earth are the ones that are going to go through the tribulation. In fact, do you know that most of those who expound upon Bible prophecy today say that Revelation 4 through Revelation chapter 20 will be fulfilled after the church has been raptured to heaven and it is going to take place with the Jews. If that is the case folks, we might, might as well pack up our bags and cease being Seventh-day Adventists because we say that the reason we exist is to proclaim the three angels messages. But if those messages are going to be proclaimed after the church has been raptured to heaven, why bother to proclaim them if they apply to the Jews after the church is gone? Are you understanding what I'm saying? In other words this text makes it very clear that God's people are going to go through the tribulation. But God will protect them in the midst of the tribulation. In fact, like in the destruction of Jerusalem, those who obeyed and fled and who were, who were Sabbath keepers, not one of them perished. In the same way, those who go through the tribulation, not one will perish. By the way, is it possible to go through tribulation and for God to protect you in the midst of tribulation? Of course. 
Wasn't Israel and Egypt during the plagues? Of course they were. Uh, didn't the three young men go through the fiery furnace and they were protected? Sure. How about Daniel in the lion's den? Was he protected by the power of God? So why can't God protect his people that are going through the tribulation? He can do it. In fact he's going to do it. And he's going to shorten those days because if he didn't there would be absolutely no flesh left alive. Now allow me to read you a very interesting statement that we find in Great Controversy page 631 where Ellen White draws upon much of the language of Matthew chapter 24. You know it says there that, we're, that when the uh, you know when you see the abomination of desolation you should flee to the mountains and woe to those who are with child in those days and pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath and so on. Notice Ellen White's comment on this in the chapter on the time of trouble in the great controversy. She says, yet for the elect's sake the time of trouble will be shortened. So we know what she's referring to. She says the heavenly sentinels faithful to their trust continue their watch. Though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death, their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives. But none can pass the mighty guardians stationed about every faithful soul. Some, notice this, some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages. Does Matthew chapter 24 speak about God's people fleeing from the city into the country? Absolutely. Some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall powerless as straw. Others are defended by angels in the form of men of war. So are we supposed to fear the tribulation? Are we supposed to shake in our shoes because oh we're going to go through this terrible tribulation? No! Because God says though you walk in the shadow of the valley of death you shall fear what? No evil. A thousand will fall to one side, ten thousand to the other side, but no plague will come and touch your dwelling. In other words God's people will go through the tribulation. God will shorten that period. But God's people will be protected by mighty angels who will not allow the wicked to touch his people. And then in Matthew 24 we have the counterfeit second coming of Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24 and let's read verse 23. Matthew 24 and verse 23. Then, by the word, the, the word then indicates that this is taking place after the close of probation. Do you see the sequence? Preaching of the gospel, abomination of desolation, the two groups are divided, the great tribulation, and then it says, then comes this falsification of the second coming. So the counterfeiting of the second coming is going to take place after the close of probation. And people always ask, they say, Pastor Bohr, if the tribulation uh, is after probation closes and the devil counterfeits the second coming of Jesus after the close of probation, why would he do it? All of God's people are saved and all of the wicked are already lost. So the devil knows that if he counterfeits the second coming He's not going to be able to fool God's people. Well the fact is folks that the devil is the devil. He knows that God says that God's people will not be deceived. But ever since he sinned he harbors this thought that perhaps once, some moment, I can counteract what God says in his word. By the way the same thing is going to happen after the millennium. Does the devil know that it's written in Revelation chapter 20 that he's going to prepare to attack the city? That the wicked are going to turn against him before they go against the city? The devil knows all of that. So why waste his time gathering the wicked around the city to attack the city? Because the devil is the devil. Because the devil's never going to give up without a fight. He thinks that at some point he can counteract the word of God. He says maybe this one time I can go against God's word and I can prevail. Although by his track record it becomes very clear that he's not going to be able to do it. Now notice here, then, if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there, do not what? Do not believe it. 
Now, you'll notice that this is a general statement. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24, the very next verse. For false Christs and false prophets will rise. Notice Christs in plural, did you catch that? False Christs in plural. And false prophets will rise. And what will they do? They will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, whom? The elect. Who is the target of the devil? The elect. By the way, is the group of the elect already clearly defined at this point? Obviously yes. Has the sealing taken place? Those who have fled, are they Sabbath keepers? According to Matthew chapter 24 and the book of Revelation. Absolutely. Are God's people fleeing because their lives are in danger? Yes. Will they be protected by God? Certainly. What is the devil going to do as a last resort? He's going to counterfeit the second coming of Jesus. Notice what it continues saying. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And now I want you to notice from false Christs, plural, suddenly the false Christ becomes an individual. Notice what we find in verse 26. Therefore, if they say to you, what? Look, He, singular, there's going to be false Christ, but this is the, the counterfeiting of Christ coming by one individual. It says, therefore if they say to you, look, He is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, He is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. In other words, verse 26 makes it cl very clear that there will be one particular individual who will claim to be Christ with the intention of deceiving God's elect. Now it's interesting to find in Scripture that this counterfeit second coming is not going to deceive God's people. And it's not going to deceive God's people because the Bible makes it very very clear in multiple places that when Jesus returns the second time He is not going to touch this earth. Allow me to share quickly some of those verses with you. Notice 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, I'm not going to read them, you probably know these verses. It says, The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be what? shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? to meet the Lord in the air. If we're going to meet Him in the air, He did not come all the way down. Matthew 24 verse 30 says that Jesus will send His angels to gather His elect. Notice that He's in the air and He's sending His angels to gather His elect. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1 the Apostle Paul is speaking about the second coming and he speaks about our gathering to him. Not his gathering to us, but, he, but our gathering to him. And of course you know John 14 verse 3 where Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and stay with you forever. That's not what he says. I will come again and what? and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus promised Peter, he says, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you will follow me later. He says, I'm going to my Father's house. So is Jesus promising his people that he's going to take them to heaven? Yes. By the way, do you know why the Protestant churches invented the, the theory of the, of the rapture? You see, Jesus made two promises. He promised, first of all, that He was going to take His people to His Father's house. That's heaven. But He made, a, made another promise that the meek shall inherit the earth. So Jesus had to fulfill two promises. He had to fulfill, first of all, the promise to take His people to heaven. And secondly, the promise to give them the earth as the inheritance. So those who teach a rapture, they say, now how could Jesus fulfill both of those promises? Well, the only way is if Jesus comes back seven years before His glorious coming and He takes His people to heaven for seven years, the church to heaven for seven years, that fulfills promise number one, and then seven years later He comes in His glorious coming, He sets up His kingdom here, and there He fulfills His second promise. But as Adventists we believe that both of those promises can be fulfilled in a different way. 
we believe that there's only one second coming of Jesus His glorious coming on the clouds of heaven at that time Jesus will fulfill His first promise by taking His people to heaven for a thousand years and then after the thousand years He will come back and then the meek will inherit the earth in other words it is not necessary to have a pre-tribulation rapture for Jesus to fulfill both of those promises the key is that the millennium will be the period of God's people where? the period of God's people in heaven by the way did you know that according to 2 Thessalonians 2 there is going to be a counterfeiting of the second coming of Jesus? you know one of the words that is used to describe the second coming is the word parousia that's translated coming do you know that in 1st Th 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse th verses 2 and 3 it speaks about the fact that Jesus will not come parousia until the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who sits in the temple of God in other words Jesus will not come his parousia will not take place but later on in the chapter you find the Antichrist who according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 also has a parousia the word is used for him also it says who's coming it with signs and wonders and all kind of lying miracles in other words before Jesus comes there is going to be a false parousia or a false coming of Satan counterfeiting the second coming of Jesus by the way do you know that most of the Christian world is going to receive Satan as Christ? do you know why? because they're expecting when Jesus comes gloriously they're expecting, to set, expecting him to set up his kingdom here so when Satan walks upon the earth and he does miracles and he speaks some of the beautiful words that Jesus spoke they're going to say oh this is the Christ because they're expecting Christ to come to the earth but God's people will not be deceived because we know that when Jesus comes he's not coming all the way to the earth so is it important for us to know where we're going to spend the millennium? of course it's vitally important is it important for us to realize that there's not going to be a pre-tribulation rapture it's a matter of life and death now allow me to read you Ellen White's vivid description of the counterfeit second coming of Jesus by Satan this is found in the book The Great Controversy pages, let me see if I can find it here, page 625 as the crowning act in the great drama of deception Satan himself will personate Christ in other words he'll present himself as Christ the church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness by the way she's commenting on 2nd Thessalonians 2 she says Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation listen to this the glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld the shout of triumph rings out upon the air Christ has come Christ has come the people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth his voice is soft and subdued yet full of melody see the devil can talk full of melody too in gentle compassionate tones he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered is he going to speak truth? he most certainly is some of them he heals the diseases of the people by the way 2nd Thessalonians 2 says that this Antichrist will perform signs and wonders and miracles she continues saying he heals the diseases of the people and then in his assumed character of Christ he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday 
and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. And then she says this, this is the strong almost overmastering delusion. Almost overmastering delusion. By the way that expression God will send them strong delusion comes from where? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We need to study that chapter because it describes how the devil is going to counterfeit the second coming of Jesus. Now how are God's people going to be protected from this almost overmastering delusion? Allow me to continue reading this statement and I'll give you the answer and then I'll read the rest of the statement. Two things. Number one Satan will not be allowed to counterfeit the manner of Christ's coming, the way in which he comes according to the Bible. And secondly, the content of his teachings will unmask him. The manner of his coming and the content of his teachings. Now look for this in the last part of this statement. She says, but the people of God will not be misled. The teachings, notice this, the teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image. The very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. In other words, he blesses those upon, who, upon whom the wrath of God is going to be poured out. Then she says, and furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point, and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Notice what she's quoting uh, here as she's spoken about this counterfeit second coming. Here it is again. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point, and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then she concludes by saying this, this coming there is no possibility of counterfeiting. It will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. So what are the two ways in which God's people are going to protect themselves from this almost overmastering delusion? Number one, because of the content of the teachings of this false Christ. He's going to teach that Sunday is the day of rest when the Bible says that it's the Sabbath. And secondly, he's going to be walking upon the earth as a glorious being. He's not going to be able to counterfeit the coming of Jesus on the clouds to planet earth in power and great glory. But folks, we say, oh this will be easy, piece of cake. Don't you think so? The devil can counterfeit things perfectly, believe it or not. The voice of Jesus, he's heard the voice of Jesus many times. He heard it in heaven. He heard it while Jesus was on earth. He's able to counterfeit the description of Jesus of the second coming in scripture. And if we go by our eyes and by our ears and by our feelings and emotions and experiences we will be deceived in an instant. We must check everything by what the Word of God says. And then I want you to notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28. This is a very interesting verse. You remember the eagles that were the sign of the destruction, the abomination that was going to lead to desolation and destruction? Notice Matthew 24 verse 28. For wherever the carcass is, there the what? There the eagles will be gathered together. And we've already studied about the eagle. The eagle of ancient Rome. 
the eagle which was adopted by the United States of America as that symbol. The golden wreath around the eagle representing the sun god Mithra and what we find on the great seal of the United States, the eagle with its face turned towards the right, arrows in its talons and a sunburst above its head. By the way during the Middle Ages you also see this great abomination of the sun god. You know you look in Roman Catholic cathedrals, uh, you look for example in St. Peter's Basilica or in the Vatican Museum. It is incredible the number of illustrations, the number of pictures, the number of artifacts that contain sunbursts. Once when you enter St. Peter's Basilica the first thing that catch, at least the first thing that caught my eye is a huge sunburst at the front of St. Peter's Basilica. In other words the sun is everywhere. And of course the Roman Catholic Church claims that they have changed the day of worship from God's Sabbath to the day of the sun. Protestants have adopted this. And Bible prophecy says that believe it or not in the United States of America this nation represented by the eagle, the day of the sun will be enforced and those who do not re receive this will not be able to buy or sell and eventually a death decree will be uttered against them. And probably some of those who are watching are saying, Pastor Bohr, this is preposterous. It could never happen in these United States. Well we've studied that once before it almost happened. And we also had one full lecture where I read quotations about what the religious right in the United States is saying. About the union between Protestants and Catholics. About the separation of church and state. About the importance of Sunday for them as a day of rest. We've noticed not only that this is possible, but it's happening before our eyes. And once before in the 1880s it took place in the United States. There was a Sunday law that was proposed that was almost passed. And so before we say that this is a pre preposterous interpretation perhaps we should go back to scripture and study scripture more carefully. Now let's read verses 29 to 31 of Matthew 24. It says there in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days Remember that I've said that the signs in the heavens have how many fulfillments? They have a preliminary fulfillment when the first period of the tribulation is coming to an end. And they will have another greater fulfillment on a worldwide scale announcing the second coming of Jesus at the end of the second stage of the tribulation. Now let's read this passage. Immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. These are signs that announce that Jesus is about to come. Signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And then notice verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth even unto the other. I want to underline folks that the papacy has two stages. Therefore the tribulation through which God's people go has two stages. The signs in the heavens also have two stages, indicating that the tribulation is coming to an end and the coming of Jesus is near. Now as Adventists we've always said that there were signs that took place towards the end of the 1260 years which fulfilled Bible prophecy. We have for example the great Lisbon earthquake in 1755. We have also the dark day in 1780. Actually the day got dark and that night the moon looked like it was what? Blood. And then in 1833 we have the falling of the stars from heaven. Now interestingly enough if you look at the order of the signs as they're given in Revelation 6 verses 12 and 13 you'll notice that there the signs are in the identical order as when they took place chronologically at the end of the first period of the tribulation. 
you have first of all a great earthquake. It says there in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. Then it says that the sun would not give its light. Then it says that the moon would be turned into blood or would look like blood and the stars would fall from heaven. That is the exact chronological sequence of what happened in 1755, 1780 and 1833. Exactly chronologically the way we find it in Scripture. So were there signs in the sun, the moon and the stars marking the end of the period of tribulation? Absolutely. But let me ask you, when God's people are being persecuted in the end time tribulation, when this beast system, when this little horn resurrects to power again, are there going to be signs in the heavens that announce the second coming of Jesus in power and glory and the end of the captivity of God's people. Absolutely. Now you'll notice that in Revelation chapter uh, 6 and verses 12 and 13 it says that the moon would be turned into blood and the stars would fall from heaven. But you'll notice that in Matthew chapter 24 we're told that the sun would not give its light, it says that the moon would got not give its light, and the stars of heaven would not give their light. In other words they would be darkened. The signs are a little bit different. The signs of Revelation 6, 12 and 13 are the preliminary signs. The darkening of the sun, the great earthquake, the moon looking like blood, and the falling of the stars from heaven. In Matthew 24 the emphasis is upon the end time signs because they're a little bit different. There's the darkening of the sun, there's the darkening of the moon, and there's also the stars not giving their light. The stars, in other words, disappearing from the firmament, disappearing from the sky. It says there in Matthew chapter 24 that the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What are the powers of the heavens? The powers of the heavens, what did God create to rule the day? See the rule is the word that's used in Genesis 1.16. The sun rules the day. What rules the night? The night is ruled by the moon. So the powers of heaven that, that are moved or that don't give their light are what? The sun, the moon, and the stars. Interestingly enough Ellen White explains that in in early writings page 41 that when God utters his voice delivering his people when he says it is done the tribulation is finished she says there that, it, that God's voice is so powerful you know the voice of Enrico Caruso could break glasses and we say wow what a voice that the vibrations could actually break glasses well I'll tell you folks the voice of God is going to be so powerful according to early writings page 41 she says the sun, the moon and the stars will be moved out of their places. That's the reason why during the millennium the planet is in darkness. Because the sun has been moved out of its place. The moon has been moved out of its place. The stars no longer shine upon planet earth. Because at the voice of God, when God's people are delivered at the end of this second stage of the tribulation, the voice of God is so powerful that the powers of the heavens are moved out of their places. And that's the reason why when God makes a new heavens and a new earth, He is going to once again place the sun, the moon, and the stars in a place where they will benefit planet earth. Finally I would like to deal with one point before we draw this to an end. It says that the sign of the Son of Man will be seen in heaven. And He will send His angels, and His angels will go to the four winds, and they will gather His elect from the four winds. Not only those who are alive and remain, but those who died in Christ will be raised up. The angels will be sent to gather God's people. Those who died in Christ and those who are alive and remain will be gathered together by the holy angels to be taken up to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. Now allow me to talk about that sign of the second coming. Do you know what the sign is? 
I'll just be very brief. All we have to do is go back to the story of Elijah. You know, after Elijah went through his experience with the threefold union, you know, with Ahab and Jezebel and the false prophets of Baal, by the way, that whole story symbolizes what's going to happen in the end time. After Elijah went through this experience, there was a death decree given ex against him. He fled to the wilderness. He went through a period of tribulation. God fed him while he was in the wilderness and so on. Immediately after that, the Bible says that he saw in heaven a little what? A little cloud. He goes and looks, actually he goes and looks six times. When he goes and he looks the seventh time, he sees a little cloud about the size of a man's fist. Do you know what that was? That was the chariot that was coming from heaven to pick up Elijah. Interesting. The story is told in 2 Kings chapter 2. You know, Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan River. Elijah had seen the sign. It was a sign that announced that the chariot was coming and he was going to be picked up by the Lord to be taken to heavenly glory. And then of course we know what happened when they crossed the Jordan. The Bible says there in, in 2 Kings chapter 2 that a glorious chariot descended from heaven. Do you know what the chariot of God is? The Bible says that the chariots of God are His glorious angels. And so the glorious angels who, who drive this chariot, they're the wheels that drive the chariot, according to Ezekiel chapter 1, will come. They will pick up God's elect and put them in the chariot. And then they will take it, be taken to Christ's heavenly kingdom to dwell with Him for a period of a thousand years. By the way, this is the scene that inspired that famous Negro spiritual swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to what? Coming for to carry me home. You know that song was composed in the midst of great tribulation and great persecution by the African Americans in the United States when they were going through a period of terrible slavery. These songs were composed that were the song of their experience and their, their desire, their intense desire for the suffering to come to an end and for Jesus to return, for the chariot to come to take His people home. Well, the time is coming when God's people are going to be enslaved upon planet earth. Once again, jailed, forbidden from buying and selling, under the sentence of death. And then God's people will be able probably to compose songs during that period. Or perhaps even sing this song. Because now it will be the song of the experience of all of God's people. Swing low, sweet chariot coming for to carry me home. This is the glorious hope of the church folks. This is the reason for our existence. Unfortunately we have been distracted from our hope. We have been distracted from our roots. We have been distracted from our message. We have been distracted from our mission. And we have been distracted from our hope. We're so caught up in this world. We're so caught up in our things, in our toys, in our houses, in our money, in our automobiles, in so many things that are going to be destroyed when Jesus comes. None of this counts. None of this matters. What shall it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. Folks, there is a very important preparation that needs to take place before the coming of Jesus. God's people, if we should be alive, will go through this great tribulation, the most intense period of persecution in the history of the world. There will only be two groups on planet earth. Those who keep God's holy Sabbath and those who keep the first day of the week. Both of those will be signs either of obedience or of disobedience. Those who flee will not flee in the winter or on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the day of rest. All of the rest will remain where they are. And when they see the abomination of desolation it will be too late because they have not escaped from the general ruin which is about to come. 
And so God calls upon us to prepare a character fit for eternity. A character that will withstand everything and anything that will come. You know that's not going to come automatically. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. But Jesus promises to walk with us all the way. It reminds me of the three young men who were thrown into the fiery furnace. You know, the firmness of their character was not formed in that crisis, it was exhibited in that crisis. They had their minds made up beforehand. They had a close relationship with Jesus beforehand, before going through that tribulation. The period of the, of the furnace heated hotter than ever before, just like the final tribulation will be the worst in history, in intensity. And when they appeared before Nebuchadnezzar, who raised this, this image in honor of himself, the beast, and commanded everyone to worship on pain of death, the young man said, we will not. We worship the true God. And the God whom we serve is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we still are his servants. That's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. A service of love that even if nothing good comes, we would still serve God because God is our Lord and because we love Him. That's the kind of character that God is expecting from us who will go through this period of tribulation. And so we must make decisions that will last unto eternity. We must place our priorities in order. We must take that which we consider primary and put it as secondary. And take that that we have considered secondary and place it as primary in our lives. And I pray to God that that will be the experience of each one of us.